Everybody, Raul here for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the extraordinary honor and pleasure of chatting with none other than Pete Trevalas. Pete, how are you today? I'm very good, Raul. How are you? Outstanding, outstanding. Well, yeah. we have so much interesting stuff to talk about, especially with your band Marillion, and yeah. we definitely want to dive into that. But as always, we like to go to the past. How did you get started in music, and particularly on bass? I was always musical, I guess. I mean, I remember from a very early age listening to the radio. We always had music on in the house. My dad used to play jazz piano. He, he wasn't professional because he, was, he came from an age where his father said, you're going to go into the law like I did and you're going to become a solicitor. Mm -hmm. And that's what, it, that's what he had to do. And that's what he did. But he used to play saxophone and he used to play jazz piano and... He was, he was drafted during the Second World War. When I say drafted, he signed up to the RAF mm -hmm. and he went overseas to do his flight training. And while he was there, there was a, a, often a lot of kind of musicians would was vi visit the troops and he would be roped in to play piano with them. And, you know, he was, he was a fine, fine musician. I never realised until later in life how oh. good he was. Because when I was a kid, I just assumed, oh, I'm sure loads of, I'm sure everyone's dad could be that, you know. And then I found out actually nobody else could really. Because he used to kind of, he used to play Oscar Peterson and Count Basie and all kinds of stuff. He was a serious, wow. serious jazz piano player. But one romantic story from him, he sold his saxophone to buy an engagement ring for his fiance. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah. And then they, they, they ended up getting married and had me and my elder sister. But that's quite, that's quite romantic. Yeah, I'm sure he's more romantic than I am, actually. There, there you go. Well, uh, hopefully she didn't regret that sacrifice because yeah. the, no, the no. instruments tend to have the musician's mojo in them. And so when you let them go... Yeah, they can. They yeah. can do. So, I mean, we had a piano in the house. We always had the radio on when I was a kid. I remember... You know, there was one radio station in the UK at the time, really, called The Light Programme. It was a BBC programme, and it played everything. It played everything from the Beatles to the Kinks to Frank Sinatra, all sorts of people, you know. And so I got to hear a lot of music, you know, whatever was, whatever was in the charts or just popular at the time was played on the radio. Mm -hmm. And my wanting to learn an instrument properly came from when I saw the Beatles at Shea Stadium. It was filmed and then it was broadcast in the UK um, quite a lot at the time. And yeah. as you can imagine, in the 60s, the Beatles were huge. Absolutely. So um, I saw them getting out of their helicopter and everyone screaming and then playing their songs. And I thought, that looks, that looks good. And I used to, you know, I used to be a fan of the Beatles anyway. So I used to... I played ukulele to start with, because my grandfather had a ukulele, so my, my dad bought me one. Then my sister wanted guitar lessons, and I wanted guitar lessons. And my parents said, well, let's, let's, let's see how your sister gets on. And so, but I was allowed to sit in on her guitar lessons, and she was being shown chords and how to strum. And then when, when her lesson was finished, I'd pick up the guitar and just do it. It yeah. was just... It seemed there, and you know, I remember from an early age when I listened to music, I seemed to understand what was going on. I, I could pick out tunes on a piano. I could sort of, you know, my dad would sit me down and say, "Well, look, you know, this is this, this is two notes that, that you know make a good sound." And <laughs> this, this three three notes here is called a chord, and he'd show me where middle C was and all of that stuff. So I I just picked stuff up, and then I, you know, when I was a bit older. My best friend, actually, who's still a, 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 a jobbing guitarist, he's just come back off a tour with Howard Jones, actually. You know, we both used to play guitar together and work out how to play stuff and how, what to do. And, and then we formed bands together. And, and then eventually we went our own separate ways to try and get into music professionally. So how did the bass come about then? Well, the bass came about because I wasn't as good a lead guitar player as my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, well, something's got to give. And then I figured, actually, bass is pretty cool. And I, you know, I, I started to then realize 
what McCartney actually did in the Beatles. Mm. I was about I was about eleven or twelve when I started just picking out bass notes on a guitar because I had an electric guitar and I was saving up. As always, when you're a, you know a, a kid wanting to play in- instruments, you're always saving money for something. So if it's guitar strings or valves for an amplifier or a lead or a new capo or a guitar strap, whatever it is, I always wanted money for everything. So I used to, before I bought a bass, I used to just pick out bass notes on the, on the guitar, turn the treble right down, turn sure. the bass up on my hand. And then, um, and then I bought a, a bass guitar. It was, it didn't even have a name. That's how, how, that's how cheap it was. Um, and it was quite hard to play, but I think that's the beauty of it. All my, all the guitars I had when I was learning to play were terrible, and really, you know, really hard work. And then when I started to play better guitars, it's like, wow, this is actually quite easy, isn't it? I can see how people, you know, can get better at this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So yeah, and then went from there. I went, um, I joined a few local bands. I got. I became the kind of guy that people wanted, bass player that people wanted in their band. Nice. You know, so people were doing little things. I used to go up to Chapel Music. I had two friends that were signed to Chapel's Music Publishing. And they used to have to go up and demo their songs. So they used to ask me to go up to London, to Bond, New Bond Street, it was based, and go in their little demo studio and, and demo their songs. So that was cool. And it was a good introduction to studio and, and how a studio works. So that's how I started. And then, you know, I went to America with a band. I stupidly thought that if we can't make it in London, maybe we can make it in New York. Because yeah. oh. maybe we'd be a novelty because we were English, you know. And that didn't really work out. Although we were offered a publishing deal, but not the record deal. And that was it. That would have been the, the, the kicker, really. So then I came back and found out that a band called Marillion who were trying to get signed and were trying to create a bit of a buzz were looking for a bass player to go on a tour of Scotland. It was like a three week tour of Scotland and it's like, I've never done a three week tour. I, I used to do like pub gigs at weekends. So sure. I'd do three or four gigs a week, you know, at that, at that time because there was a lot of live music being played in the UK at that time. This would have been mid late 70s, early 80s. Mm-hmm. And then I thought, well, okay, well, I'll do that and, you know, take it from there. At the time, the kind of music that was being popular at the time was kind of a new way. Punk had, punk had kind of been and gone a little bit, a new wave and, and sort of alternative, alternative electronic music was coming through. And Marillion were a progressive rock band. So it's like, well, it's a bit dated these days, but I'll give it a go. Sure. But I mean, I was, I kind of cut my teeth on progressive music. You know, I was, after listening to the Beatles, I kind of went on a journey between Alice Cooper. And then after Alice Cooper, well, you know, Dennis Dunaway, I think it was, the bass player with Alice Cooper at the, you know, Million dollar, ba- billion dollar babies and schools out time was was a really musical player, you know, and, and the, that kind of writing and the music it was kind of semi progressive and it was semi rock at the same time, mm-hmm. and that kind of interested me. And then I got into Yes and Genesis and Caravan. I used to listen to Caravan and Focus a lot actually when I was in school as well. I had another friend who had an older brother. I used to kind of rifle through all his records while he was out. <laughs> We were home, you know. <laughs> so that was cool. Nice. Yeah. Well, music has so evolved, and again, for if when you've been with the band as long as you've got, because it's been three three decades. Yeah. Not. Well, I've been in four four decades. Wow. Before. Okay. I joined in eighty two. There we go. Yeah. So as music itself evolves, because I remember. I was, again, very influenced by the Beatles myself. As a matter of fact, I was playing accordion when they hit the United States, when they were doing the Ed Sullivan show. Sure. And right. the first thing I did was go, you can't play Beatles music on an accordion. This is not cool. I need to get my hand on a guitar. Yeah. I, I need yeah, to do, sure. do something different. So huge influence, but it seems that 
especially back then, you know, it was either rock or it was jazz. It was it was very clean cut. But then as things moved ahead, you got progressive rock. Even when you get into metal, there's death metal. There's you know, oh, you know, there's hundreds. It, it starts splintering, and then they kind of blend over each other. And so one of the things that I've I've noticed with Marillion's music is a a, a evolution. Oh yeah, if you will. That especially you guys just released your latest album an hour before it's dark. Sure. Just the week before we're having this conversation. If I understand correctly in itself, it is also part of the evolution because it is influenced in great part by current events with the pandemic sure, and everything that's been happening over the last couple of years. Yeah. Yeah, the pandemic and climate change really kind of feature. They don't, it's, it's not like a concept and we didn't necessarily, we didn't even want to write about the pandemic. When we started writing this, we kind of started edging ourselves into working on a new album um, about four years ago, probably. And as you can imagine, when you when you've written and released as much material as we have, it's like we know we we're, we're a bit wary of of just sitting in a studio and coming up with music because. You know, there's a history, and we want to make sure that whatever we release is the best thing it can possibly be, mm -hmm. and it has to be up to the standard of what we've released before. You know, the criteria really is: if if it wouldn't fit on the last album, then it's not good enough. You know, and we always try and better that anyway. So, so we set high benchmarks for ourselves, and that meant that rather than sitting in the studio twiddling our thumbs, thinking, "Well, has anybody got no, a musical idea?" Mm -hmm. You know. We tend to just have fun and jam, and really just get into enjoying the music that we're making at the time. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter. It can be. It can. It can sound pompous. It can sound like jazz. It can sound like a national anthem of a very a little country. You know, it sure. doesn't matter what it is. It can. It can just be anything. Our producer and also sixth member of the band, Mike Hunter, he is a librarian of all of these little events. And uh, we have a cloud-based system where we can access all of the ideas of any nodes. Hmm. And then eventually we got round to putting them into kind of our favorite files. And, and we had favorite lists and we had favorite song idea lists and favorite guitar thing lists and favorite noises, all sorts of stuff. <laughs> and then we got to the stage where we thought, well, we've got the building blocks for some stuff here. You know, there's some things starting to happen. And we gradually, you know, worked on those and got round to arranging the, the songs that we, we put on this album. We're not very good at writing, per se. <laughs> We're very good at collaborating and, you know, egging each other on. And, you know, we enjoy the musical journey of where something can go. Hey, that's cool. Mm -hmm. But if you did this, would that work? And did that, would that work with that thing that we had a few months ago that, you know, might play us? So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very cool way of working. Nice. You know, we're in a beautiful situation where we don't, we're not beholden to a record company. Ah. We're sort of, you know, we're as financially secure as, as any band can be, really. We have the kind of holy grail of having our own studio, own place to work, and just it, everything's tied in. We work, you know, we walk in, the, the, everything is ready for us to record and be, uh, and be you know, put on committed to hard drive these days. I would have said tape <laughs> years ago. And yeah, it's a very cool situation. And we have such dedicated fans as well who really allow us the freedom that we have. Very so it's cool. A, it's a cool way to work. We were very pleased with it. We were quite, you know, we were all quite inspired by this album. And, and to get the praise, I mean, we've got, we've got some, some amazing comments and some great praise. We're actually, as we speak, we're still... We were, we've been number two in the midweek charts for three days now. Nice. Yeah, we're between the Stereophonics, in the UK, I should say. Mm -hmm. We're between the Stereophonics and Ed Sheeran, so we're in high company there. Whether it will stay, I don't know, but today I'll, get, I'll take it. <laughs> there you go. Well, and there's a couple of things. You mentioned a vast amount of music. This was studio album number 20 for you guys. So, yeah. I mean, that that's a very landmark number of, of albums. It is. And then because this is a collaborative effort, 
how do you come up with your baselines particularly? It, it, it is easy many times, I think, for musicians to be you know, drawing on external influence, but so much of this is your guys' own sound. How, yeah. how do you do this? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> the, the short answer is whenever I've tried to sound like anybody else, I remember when I was a kid, I was like, I want to sound like Chris Squire, or, mm -hmm. oh, I want to sound like Mike Rutherford on Selling England by the Pound, which I think Battle of Epping Forest has an immense bass sound. I mean, there's very few bass sounds much better than that, mm -hmm. uh, in my humble opinion. And, and I never, ever did. I, I, I never had the equipment to actually nail somebody else's sound. Mm. And also, even when I was playing good guitars, I still just sounded like me. <laughs> so I got to the stage where I just thought, well, you know, maybe it's just me, maybe maybe I'm stuck with this, so I may as well make it work, you know. And I kind of have over the years with Meridian. I should also mention Chasm Sultan from Utopia, because he was another influence of mine actually and I very rarely mention him and I kind of forget but I used to um, I used to love the Ra album when that came out mm. I don't know whether you're familiar with that it's not a, so it's really good it's a more progressive kind of Todd Rundgren album but it's really cool and it's got some great bass lines on it it's interesting because again I lived I lived out of the United States for 18 years oh, and yeah. Part of what that effect had is that I was not influenced by what the labels were releasing in this country. I was exposed to a whole other set of Latin American music. Yeah. And so there were many bands that did great things, but because they weren't in that particular circuit, I didn't hear them. You know, now yeah. I heard of other, other groups that a lot of people up here hadn't ever heard of and so there's a bleed over of it now because of the internet because of our interconnectivity now more and more people can go back and go oh let me hear oh the, mention this person and you know you see the the, the flow of influences but coming yeah. coming back to your sound gear specifically how are you getting your sound well these days i'm using i used to have i mean i had an ampeg for a while sbt mm -hmm. more recently i used laney actually Okay. I had a I had a really nice relationship with Laney, which is a UK based company. And you know, I tend to get given if I'm given or if I you know buy stuff these I tend to get given the higher end of the range stuff. Nice. So and they had a really cool transistor and valve amp. I kind of always I mean the sound I tend to like to go for is where I scoop a little bit of the mids out. Mm -hmm. What I tend to do more these days is to not so much. You know, I used to really want a nice deep bass and a really bright top end because I was just trying to get various Rickenbackery type sounds. Yeah. These days, I'm, it's a little bit flatter. I, I still favor quite a lot of bass and quite a lot of top. Nice. But I use Warwick these days. I've got to do, I've, 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 for years and years, actually, I should mention, I've, I've played Warwick thumb basses. Nice. I've got an old, I've got one of the kind of original Warwick thumb basses. You were saying you would you talk to Hans Peter. Yes, yes. So I went up to the factory a few years back, and I've got one of the early thumb bases. Uh, I was given two a long, long time ago when they just pretty much started, moved over, moved between Framus and 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 Warwick, mm -hmm. and started building bases. So both of my original ones are um, are hand built. They're machine built these days. They have a yes. fantastic machine at the up there where that does all of the the drilling and the milling and everything. It's amazing actually. But there's something kind of cool about having something that's handmade. And Absolutely. the woods are older. The woods are a bit older because at the time you could get older woods. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they've just got a really nice tone. So those are my go to bases. I used to use Boss FX pedals actually. Okay. When I was doing we used to do a lot of touring, you know, bigger quite big places. We've actually, we, we still do, we still do a lot of touring, thinking about it, but I've gone on to, at the moment I use a Digitech pedal board, which is the source of all my effects, really. Nice. And I used to run that with the amp setting and some of the speaker settings, although 
I tended to turn the speakers off because I, I put it through an amp anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a bit superfluous. But these days I've turned the amp setting off. You can just run it just as a pedal board effect unit, but still have the functionality of, of having all of your effects in the chain wherever you want. So you can have, you can just quick, very quickly. Well, the, the, the great thing about the Digitech pedal board is that it's got a lot of switches. So rather than having to change banks all the time, you can just have like up to 20 switches on, on one particular bank. And mm -hmm. that'll do most of a set really for me. Yes. And if, with longer songs, you know, I can have five, five things in a row and I can just switch between whether I'm playing heavy bass or whether I'm playing a bit of chorus or a bit of echo chorus. Because I do kind of finger picking sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I play sometimes, I'll play a bit, a few chords, and sometimes I'll pick with a pick um, in a kind of folk guitar style. Because I learned to play guitar before bass, so, sure. you know, I kind of sometimes utilize that stuff. Well, so, even the pick will give you a whole other sound yeah. Range as well, the well. other thing I do as well is that I try and make it a bit like Jeff Beck with his guitar. I try and get the sound source that I want from the guitar first. Okay. You know, I'll have a basic, I'll have a basic backline sound. But if I want to change the sound, if I want to make it softer, I'll either play with a softer part of the pick. I found that the round end of a pick can, it can be slightly softer than the, 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 the pointy end, for sure. whatever for a better word. And then again, fingers or maybe just the thumb like end whistle used to do mm -hmm. and depending on where in, on you know where along the strings you're plucking or or, or finger picking uh, you know there's a whole range of tones there so i kind of utilize those as well you know people have said oh have you ever thought about doing giving guitar lessons i wouldn't know where to start <laughs> because i've probably forgotten all the stuff that i had to learn in the first place sure you, you just kind of pick it up and then you forget it once you've got it don't mm -hmm. you oh i do well, and it's it it certainly takes a, a special effort when you're teaching to digest and communicate those concepts. Whereas if you do them automatically, it, yeah. it, it it's I'm I'm sure the the same is true with the chef or anything. If you had to ask him, sure. what yeah. are the the exact ingredients? By now, they just throw you know pinch here or some of this, and it turns out the way they wanted to. I, I, coming back to your bass, though, do you have a preference in strings? Any particular? I always used to use rotor sound strings, mm -hmm. and then I got a deal with the, there's a company called the Bass Center in the UK, and I used to use their Elite, which were basically like rotor sound, round, round steel strings. Okay. I never got, I never really got on with all that nickel stuff and coated strings and <laughs> things. I just found that. Sounds a bit too posh. I want it. I want to. I want a kind of rock and roll sound to start with. You know, mm -hmm. I don't want. I want a sound that will stand out in a track. There you go. And sometimes you can sound a bit too precise. Not that I'm a particularly precise player, but I just. I don't know. They just work for me. I've moved on to Warwick strings. I started to find that. A lot of strings. I don't know what. I don't know whether the string. I don't know whether the metals they use these days or the core density is slightly different to how strings used to be when I was a kid. But mm -hmm. they didn't seem as heavy sounding. Even though I've always used 105 to 45, which is a basic standard set of bass strings. Sure. And I have a four-string player. And the, the, the reason for that, it's not, I'm, I'm not averse to five strings, well, I'm a little frightened of playing one, mm -hmm. uh, if I'm honest. But all my favorite bass lines were written on a four string bass. I think that, you know, that having to work out how you're going to get up and down the neck and what you're going to do mm -hmm. is, it, the, you know, the challenges that brings allows the fluid bass lines styles. That, um, so I'm a big fan of four string basses. <laughs> you have to write up the neck rather than across. You know, and it's sure. very easy for technical players to just go up and down the, you know, across across the neck, sure. rather than having a, you know, and the sound when you go up the neck to the, you know, up to the twelfth fret and above, it just sounds, deep. it sounds different, you know. So that's cool too. So much of it depends on again what the music is asking for, and as you've mentioned, a lot of tunes yeah. are are made for four strings. 
a lot of the like five string people I talk to, if they're playing in Broadway shows, most of those shows are written for five string now. So yeah, yeah sure, it, I know. Yeah, I realize a lot of sessions as well. You just need a few deeper notes. Exactly. And I guess that's part of that is because of the way the keyboards, you know, and the, the length of keyboards and the sounds that they can produce tends sure. to affect what the bass needs to do around all of that, mm -hmm. you know. Absolutely. And it's cool. I think it's cool having all of that. You know, I mean, I quite often tune down. Sure. Either I'll either use a drop D or I'll tune down a tone. It's funny because a lot of I found over the years a lot of Swedish guitarists don't go anywhere near standard tuning. They're all they're, they're all in like they're, they're all either low chord type things with a few. I don't know. They 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 have a whole different idea of how to play a guitar. It seems interesting. Which is quite interesting. Yeah, the heavy stuff. There we go. And as we look ahead, we're coming kind of on the tail end of the pandemic. Yeah. And but there's all kinds of stuff in in the world happening, so it it's, yeah. it really affects plans for the future. But what plans do you guys have for the future? Well, uh, we're, we're we're pretty busy. I'm actually busier than uh, some <laughs> because I'm actually in a band called Transatlantic as well. Oh wow! With Mike Portnoy, uh, used to be in Dream Theater, of course, and Neil Morse and Royna Stoll from The Flower Kings. Who also released an album this week, actually, oh, which wow. is worth checking out. Mm -hmm. It's called By Royal Decree, so I'll just get a shout out to, to Royna's band there. Nice. And I'm going on tour with them. I'm, so the first thing I do is go to Poland with Marillion. Now, Poland is very close to the Ukraine, so if anybody is being aware of what's going on in the world at the moment, that's kind of a crazy part of the world. But Obviously, Poland is part of NATO and is part of the EU, you know, alliance and all of that. So that's kind of a safe haven for Ukrainian people to get across the border and have some escape from what's going on in their own country at the moment. Sure. But we're scheduled to do a convention. So we have these we have these weekends that we do, and it's basically like a festival with everything to do with Marillion. And we have a few guest artists with us, mm -hmm. but it's basically a Marillion three-night festival. And each night is a completely different show. So one night we'll feature, well, one night we're featuring the new album, and then some other songs and encores. Another night we're just doing a load of the faster songs from kind of, um, not a history as such, but a brief look through some of the faster, rockier, maybe more commercial, songs that we've done of which there are many mm -hmm. and um and then another night we take a kind of favorite album and we feature that so we're featuring season's end as well which again season's end the, the title of the track was written about climate change some 30 years ago now when steve hogarth first joined the band so we've been talking about climate change for a while we haven't just jumped on the bandwagon the young people of the world are much more interested in trying to help the planet than everyone else. It seems everyone else is like, well, I can't, I can't possibly not use petrol in my car. Oh, yeah. yeah. Heaven forbid, heaven forbid I can't charge my phone when I need to. Yeah. <laughs> I have to use my iPad instead, you know. There we go. Well, and I think for the young people, they look at it as, as a real, because it is their problem. It's, it really is their problem. Exactly. And I was, you know, I was watching a documentary on the climate change in regards to the Arctic and the Antarctic and the permafrost, the permafrost that mm -hmm. is just melting away, which causes a chain reaction, of course. That, that causes the Earth to heat up and that causes then the ice to melt more. And it's an irreversible cycle, Yes. as far as I can see. So, I don't know. I don't know where we go from here, actually. Well, and it is important, I think, for musicians to be the spokespeople of humanity in many times because they can put in words thoughts that people have, but maybe they haven't put together quite yeah. firmly. And so I, I know how many times have you know people chosen a song with the love of their life. They say, this is our song. 
And it's because the song has the words that say what I want to say, but I didn't put together myself. Yeah, so, yeah. The, usually there's usually a, a, a poet or a, a, or a very good wordsmith in front of those kind of bands and those kind of messages. Exactly. Uh, which is very cool. And the, the um, one about climate change, this, this is an important message. And it's so, a very important message. It needs to be put you, out there. You know, we, we don't want to preach. We're not trying to preach. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're trying to do is just say, well, look, you know, these are these are some of the things that's that's going on, you know, and we need to we need to have a think about it at least Absolutely. and open a debate about it. If nothing else. Well, and if people want to stay on top of what you're doing, again, so much of it has to do with Marillion. So Marillion.com. Marillion.com is where we are. We've had that website for many, many years, actually. We were at the forefront of bands on the internet and crowdfunding as well, actually. We are doing several of these weekends throughout the early summer. We, do, we start off in Poland, mm -hmm. then we do the cruise to the edge. Oh, nice. Between Poland and the cruise to the edge, I'm doing a short tour with Transatlantic in America, North America, I should say, because we're going to Canada as well. Okay. And then we both bands are on Cruise to the Edge, so I'm doing a double, two double headlines, because both bands do two shows. And then we are playing in Sweden. Stockholm in Sweden is with the next uh, Marillion Festival or convention. Mm -hmm. After that, we go to... Well, I want to say Montreal. I think it's Montreal after that. And then we do the UK. And then after the UK, I think we go to Portugal because it's oh. nice and sunny there in the summer. <laughs> and it's beautiful. So, yeah, three very different nights. Three diff very different kind of stage sets as well. So the whole, the whole look of each night is different. And I should say on the transatlantic tour, we, we tour North America in that little window between mm -hmm. beginning of April. Kind of like, I think we start on the 14th of April through to when the cruise is. Gotcha. And then in late, early July, I think, we are doing some shows in Europe as well. Nice. Well, and for Transatlantic, where should people look if they want to find out more okay. of the details? Well, people can look up Neil Morse's Facebook page, actually, or neilmorse.com. Okay. has a lot of Transatlantic stuff on it. The Meridian website does as well. If you look <laughs> under my solo project, you'll get that information there. And Mike Portnoy's on Instagram, Facebook, everything, actually. <laughs> there he is. And, uh, and, of course, he has a website as well, so... He has extensive touring with lots of bands, but Transatlantic is amongst them. Very, very cool. Well, and of course, Merlion has a lot of the same social media presence as well. Instagram, sure, Twitter. Facebook, yes. Instagram, Twitter. Yeah. Uh, but Merlion.com is a good port call. And then it has, you know, click through links or however you want to do it. Or just search. Just search Meridian. You'll, you'll figure it out. There we go. Well, Pete, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule oh, and pleasure. chatting yeah, with you. us, yeah. sharing your journey and all of this fun information. People, make sure you check out An Hour Before It's Dark. It's yes. hot off the presses. Give it a it listen. It yeah, it was released last week, and it's still hot in the charts in the UK and around Europe as well, actually. So we're, we're on a bit of a high. Good. Good. Who knew a, after 40 years you could still do it, huh? There we but go. Anyway, You're off to a time. splendid start. So, again, Pete, thank you so much. Folks, you've seen him here. Pete Trevavas on Bass Musician Magazine. Thank you.